Ladies and gentlemen, welcome this evening to the uh, third of this year's Gifford Lectures. Many of you who are here tonight will already be well, well acquainted with our lecturer for the year, Professor Sarah Coakley, who after a, a long period of service at the Harvard Divinity School has uh, returned to the uh, United Kingdom to take up her current post as Norris Hulse Professor of Divinity at the University of Cambridge, uh, where she's also a fellow at Murray Edwards College. Sarah is an Anglican priest in the Diocese of uh, Ely, and uh, as we've al already experienced in the previous two lectures, is a theologian of both uh, global stature and immense range. Uh, in these Gifford lectures, she's working away at the fascinating and fraught intersection of contemporary philosophical and scientific and theological concerns, and I'm Delighted then to invite uh, Professor Coakley to deliver the third of this year's lectures entitled Ethics, Cooperation, and Human Motivation, Assessing the Project of Evolutionary e Ethics. Would you welcome Professor Coakley? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philip. In my last lecture, I provided an account of the five different conditions under which the phenomenon of cooperation can, against seemingly high odds, become stable in evolutionary populations. As was explained, cooperation then acts as a countervailing and indeed fascinatingly regenerative factor alongside the competitiveness and so-called selfishness of the processes of evolutionary selection. The capacity to give a mathematically precise account of these mechanisms of cooperation and of their stochastically recurrent patterns in evolution, I suggested, marks a significant advance in precision on Darwinian theory in its original form. But it also gives the lie to recent cultural mythologies of evolution, which are wholly dominated by selfishness and violence on the one hand and erratic randomness on the other. Of course, competitiveness is at the heart of natural selection. There is no attempt to deny that here. But we now understand that there is also another principle at stake alongside mutation and selection in the full spectrum of evolution, one that it is not inappropriate to call productively sacrificial. I also stress the importance in a field where loose definitions often shelter hidden theoretic or ideological interests, of clarifying the precise meaning of cooperation in this investigation. I proposed with Martin Novak the definition for cooperation of a form of working together in which one individual pays a cost in terms of fitness while another gains a benefit. And I underscored the need to contrast cooperation in general with the subset of it which may appropriately be termed altruism on account of its specifically human intentionality. Thus, a form of costly cooperation in which an individual is motivated by goodwill or love for another. I noted in closing last time, however, that mathematical biologists who work in this area, including Novak himself at times, often naively blur the difference between pre-human and human forms of cooperation or call both of them altruism interchangeably, even making misleading anthropomorphic attributions to individuals in pre-human populations. Towards the end of the last lecture, it became obvious why this rather startling form of speech has insidiously become standard in some quarters of biological discussion. The dominance of the inclusive fitness theory of kin selection as a primary explanation of cooperative behaviors has, in the last generation, been commonly allied, though not in Novak's case, with a form of genetic reductionism, whereby the almost sole focus of explanation in evolutionary processes of cooperation has been that of individual genetic inheritance. When mathematical analyses are added to this, the language of strategies and payoffs suggests an added presumption of a sort of narrow utilitarianism whether actually intended or not. So this kind of flat genetic consequentialism served up rather oddly because of the mathematical account given of it with the game theoretical language of humanized rational choice 
has become the strange order of the day in many such discussions of cooperation. Even when the focus of ethical attention has been, as in, for instance, Richard D. Alexander's work on biological ethics, the more complex maneuvers of human indirect reciprocity and reputation, the underlying presumption has been that what humans are rarely after is their own genetic ex ex extension. As Eliot Sober and David Sloan Wilson, rare prophetic resistors of this reductionist trend in recent years, put it at the end of their 1988 book, Unto Others, it is now time to turn off this sole genetic spotlight and illuminate the whole evolutionary stage. Herein lies then, as we saw, the greatest current aporia in ev evolutionary theory, but also the greatest point of intellectual excitement and challenge. If, as Novak and the newly deconverted E.O. Wilson now charge, the inclusive fitness theory as formulated by Hamilton is mathematically questionable, then this may prove to mark the beginning of a much richer reconsideration of the other factors and behaviors alongside genetic relatedness, which are at play in pre-human cooperation, some of which also seemingly prefigure elements in the distinctive human manifestation of altruism. Such a reconsideration, as is to be suggested in tonight's lecture then, is no longer merely mathematical in nature, but underlyingly philosophical. Deeper choices, especially meta-ethical choices, have to be faced and made. It is the goal of tonight's lecture then to reconsider in the light of what we have learned so far, what we should now make of the contentious project of evolutionary ethics. Let me acknowledge that I shall have four particular questions in mind as we proceed. And although none of them can be answered definitively in this short compass, they will certainly guide my investigation along the way. First, how can we best give an account of the relation of pre-human cooperation and human altruism, blip and blop, as I playfully called them in terms of the last lecture? Should we see the latter, human altruism, seamlessly emerging from the former, or more radically supervening over it? And what considerations would cause us to favor one option over the other? Secondly, and connectedly, how should we think of the bodily and affective over against the more cognitive, rational factors in human altruism? And how is the former, in particular, related to the evolutionary inheritance of pre-human cooperation? Thirdly, what behaviors in the higher mammals and also in humans suggest what I might like to call an excess of cooperation beyond what even the mathematical accounts of the five mechanisms seem to mandate? How can we explain what these excesses mean? And fourth and last, what is the best explanatory framework overall, ethically and meta-ethically, for the phenomena of evolutionary cooperation and its human form, altruism? Or, to put this question in a decidedly unfashionable form, what is cooperation or its human subset altruism actually for? Now, to the recently dominant genetic reductionist, of course, there was only one answer to this last question. E.O. Wilson, in his earlier sociobiology mood, put it thus in a famous article for philosophy for 1986, co-written with the philosopher of science, Michael Ruse. I quote, ethics is a collective illusion of the genes put in place to make us good cooperators. Nothing more, but also nothing less, close quote. A collective illusion of the genes. This breathtakingly reductive, yet still quite commonly enunciated move to preempt sophisticated meta-ethical discussion in the area of evolution, both pre-human and human, is what we shall tonight be concerned to counter. For this is surely one of the main reasons why evolutionary ethics has been given such a bad philosophical name of late. It seems merely to presume ethical consequentialism of a particularly crass, genetically propelled form. Not only is such a position hugely more simplistic than Darwin's own perceptive and original views on ethics in The Descent of Man, 
as evolutionarily derived from group selection and so on. But, as we have already demonstrated in the last lecture, it is implicitly undercut, too, by the varied mathematical accounts of the different mechanisms, not merely that of kin, that can sustain cooperation in evolutionary populations. Finally, it utterly fails to do justice to what I've already termed the excesses of some forms of cooperation in the higher mammals and in humans, or to the specifically rich intentional and empathetic dimensions of these behaviors, which both mathematics as such, of course, cannot probe. To be sure, the mathematical modelings of Novak and his team are becoming increasingly more subtle as they are applied to complex human subject matters and behaviours. You might be interested, for instance, in their path-breaking article, Winners Don't Punish, which demonstrates, contra most economic game theory, how human subjects more disposed to forgive defectors in repeated prisoner's dilemma games ultimately fare better themselves, as does the group as a whole. But even so, as Arnon Levy has pointed out in a deft recent analysis of game theory's shortcomings in illuminating the heart of ethical choices, so much of ethical behavior is not simply success or payoff oriented in any case, but profoundly influenced also by such factors as shining moral exemplars of ethical ideals or by institutions of habit, conformity, and virtue. So let us now take up the challenge to find a better ethical explanation for the rich phenomena of cooperation and altruism than the so-called illusory genetic reduction of Ruse and the earlier Wilson. Let us seek to find one that is by all means illuminated structurally by the mathematical calculus of enabling mechanisms, no need to chuck that out, but also probes beyond it to account for factors mathematics as such cannot capture or explain. I suggest the best way to do this may first be to evince some reactions to a couple of specially provocative instances of animal behavior that appear to anticipate human altruism, and then to contrast these with some equally thought-provoking instances of human altruism, which raise another dilemma about intention. In the first animal cases, we shall have to face what I've called the issues of cooperative excess and of affective or empathetic cognizance in animal cooperation. In the second, human cases, we shall have to contrast one strangely automatic and one deviously self-conscious form of altruism in two memorably emblematic examples of intentional ethical action. We shall then be in a position to explore some richer meta-ethical frameworks for cooperation and altruism than either the reductive genetic explanation or indeed, in my view, other forms of consequentialism or emotivism. Consider first the case of dolphins, both within captivity and in the wild. In a remarkable survey article, which I commend to you, of extraordinary instances of behaviors seemingly anticipatory of or parallel to human forms of altruism, Connor and Norris survey the mathematicalized renditions of animal cooperation in the work of Trivers, that's the tit-for-tat mechanism, and Hamilton, the inclusive fitness theory now under critique, and actually judge them wholly inadequate to explain well-documented cases of the following so-called epimelitic behaviors. Dolphins, for instance, staying with an injured or dying fellow dolphin, for instance, one that was fatally injured by um, a boat and the rest of the dolphins circled it while it was bleeding to death, even though they were risking their own lives by remaining with it. Or dolphins lifting and holding up an injured fellow dolphin so as to ensure sufficient oxygen for it. Dolphins carrying around a dead pup, or in one so-called neurotic case, a small dead shark, as if it was standing in for a dead pup, as if in ritualized grief or mourning. Or, in the rather different case of pilot whales, fellow whales rescuing an injured fellow whale by a novel form of improvisation, deviously pushing him under a boat and thus out of sight and away from his human attackers. 
Such behaviors as these, especially when undertaken in highly coordinated groups, not necessarily kin-related, nor sometimes even of the same species, burst the bounds of the explanations given in our five mathematical models of cooperation. They suggest, albeit anecdotally, and scientists, of course, never like anecdotal accounts, the ability to improvise, plan, and respond to novel challenges with something approaching human intentionality. Indeed, as Alistair McIntyre argues in a lengthy discussion of dolphins in his wonderful book, Dependent Rational Animals, we have here complex systems of communication in groups and intelligent response to emergencies and unforeseen events that make it not improper, he thinks, to attribute beliefs to dolphins. Certainly, as McIntyre insists, dolphins also exhibit affections and passions and intensely modulated and interactive intelligence and forms of communication, both with each other and with humans. Whatever their form of cooperation, then, it seems to tra transcend mere reciprocal altruism in the forms mathematically explicable under the five rules, and to parallel, in some remarkable ways, some of the qualities of both affective and rational human altruism. And then there are chimps, not nearly as systematic or subtle in their cooperative behaviors as dolphins, nor, for that matter, as meerkats, um, of which more next time, meerkats really are the supreme uh, cooperators in animal life. Yet what Franz de Waal's studies of chimps' affective responses in particular has demonstrated in this long article, Putting the Altruism Back into Altruism, the Evolution of Empathy, is again something hugely significant in the area of what we might call proto-altruistic motivation. Chimps show a pervasive capacity for what Duval calls emotional contagion, reflex-like spreading of moods of fear or hilarity. But they're also capable of showing sympathetic concern or empathetic consolation, for instance, by putting an arm around a fellow chimpanzee who has just been worsted in a fight. That happens quite often, apparently. Duval wants to claim, I think here going strictly beyond the evidences, that we can therefore say that such altruistic empathy is the cause of directed altruism in chimpanzees, whether impulsive, learned, or intentional, according to his categories, rather than the initial cause being some adaptive evolutionary pattern, such as the game theorists supply. I'm not sure which comes first myself. But his main theoretic interest in querying the mathematical accounts of reciprocal cooperation is for not providing an explanation of intrinsic motivations here. Here he certainly does score a point. The theories of long-term adaptive advantage in extended tit-for-tat situations assume, of course, a kind of third-party mathematical assessor to compute the outcomes and cannot, qua retroactive stochastic accounts, give contentful explanations of internal motivation. And yet close observation of chimps over many months and years does seem to confirm motivational states of an empathetic form. Once again, then, we see here not only behaviors which in part anticipate human altruistic capacities, but also ones which seem to align both affective empathy and rudimentary forms of intentionality, a philosophy of mind, if you want to call it that. But when exactly and in what medium of rational intention and or bodily affective response is human altruism to be adjudged explicitly virtuous? Let us take another two thought-provoking cases, this time strongly contrastive ones. From these four assembled examples, both animal and human, we shall then be able to draw some preliminary conclusions about a satisfactory meta-ethical framework for cooperation and altruism, and about the place and significance of intentionality in it. Now, take the renowned case of Wesley Autry. How many of you have heard about this? Not many. Ah, okay. Very famous in America. On January the 2nd, 2007, he was standing in a New York subway station, accompanying his two small daughters back from school, when a young man in front of him started to have an epileptic seizure. 
He first attempted to assist the man in the proper medical way, but unfortunately, the young man staggered up and fell off the edge of the platform onto the track, just as a train was heard entering the station out of the tunnel. Ostensibly without a moment to think, and leaving his own children to their own devices, and they were very small, though I gather a woman bystander grabbed their hands, Autry jumped onto the track and pushed the young man down into the gap between the rails with his own body on top of him. The train could not stop in time and passed over both of them, grazing the top of Wes's head, but leaving them both otherwise unscathed. Now, what are we to make of this? It does indeed seem again to challenge the various adaptive mathematical explanations of cooperative behaviours to excess and to add a very special extra layer of remarkable human altruism. Somehow, we know not how, kindled automatically into action in an emergency and overriding even the primary parental instinct to protect one's own children. On the other hand, it does turn out that it was the case that Wes had worked on the subway in the past, so he did have the rational knowledge that the gap between the rails with the drainage hollow to be found there could accommodate one or two bodies. Don't try this in London. <laughs> Nonetheless, the instantaneous activation of selfless intention here strikes us as unusual and remarkable, possibly something evolutionarily inherited in part in some limbic form that is entirely speculative, but also given specifically human willed and rational manifestation in an instantaneous moment of decision. In strong cart up contrast, let us now consider the case of Sean Penn, your friend and mine, whose altruistic activities in another emergency after Hurricane Katrina struck in New Orleans, he rented a boat to help rescue stranded homeowners, came under strong critique, even ridicule, when he decided to take a cameraman along to record his good deeds and was said to be sporting attractive designer labels on his clothes for the show. How we should adjudicate such an action? After all, there were many other actors who did not bother to go to New Orleans at all or even send any financial contribution towards the rescue is, of course, somewhat morally ambiguous. But Friedrich Lohmann, in a recent essay on game theoretical approaches to ethics, when considered in comparison with a Kantian meta-ethical framework, illuminously uses this story as a cautionary tale. If what we care about in our meta-ethical theoretical choice is the ability to assess the purity of ethical intention, he says, and the capacity to align the reason and will with the moral law, then a Kantian model, as we shall shortly discuss in more detail, will have distinct advantages over any merely utilitarian calculus or game theoretic computation. On the other hand, it is less clear that a Kantian model can do a good job of accounting for animal evolutionary anticipations of human altruism, such as in the dolphins or the chimps. And it is also perhaps slightly murky, too, how a Kantian would interpret the Wes Autry case, since although Kant has a remarkably sophisticated account about how the affections and desires enter most importantly into moral judgments, I'm not sure how Kant himself would account for such an intensely speeded up version of this alignment in the Autry example though surely he would acknowledge Autry as having remarkably closed the gap on that fateful day between what one should do, qua universalizable moral law, and what he did do, an alignment, of course, that Kant says we must presume is possible. It's just somehow hard for me to imagine the philosopher from Königsberg doing the same with such intense spontaneity himself, but perhaps he would just have to judge Autry a saint. And this indeed is a possibility, that evolutionary ethics should perhaps not rule out and to which in due course I shall want to return. It seems though that what we've so far learned from these examples is this. A good meta-ethical theory of cooperation and altruism and of their relation will first need to take account of precursors of altruism, both intentional and affective, in non-human higher mammals and then hope to supply some assessment of this continuum and difference. But equally, and in the case of humans themselves, 
it will need to supply a discerning account of motivational variations, the difference between Wes Autry and Sean Penn, and of how reason and affect interrelate in those variations. As for stochastic mathematical accounts of human altruism, such as we find in The Prisoner's Dilemma and similar games, it would seem that these can be illuminating of such choices to a degree in indicating a certain sacrificial continuum. I have elsewhere metaphorically dubbed this the thin purple line in evolution between non-human and human patterns of behavior probabilistically computed. But if human behavior is to be tested for what we might want to call genuine altruism, then some means of accounting for the absolute purity of altruistic intention as opposed to a merely strategic, self-interested weighing of pros and cons for myself and even the group as a whole will have in contrast to be devised. So what then are the best meta-ethical contenders to account for cooperation and altruism evolutionarily conceived? That's my question for this evening. If we're going to reject the crass kind of genetic determinism that still reigns in biological circles itself, what would you choose as a framework in which to explain most satisfactorily the range of um, both pre-human and human forms of cooperation and altruism that we need to account for? Now, in the remaining sections of this lecture, I'm going to consider three possible contenders. The first is a form of neo-Aristotelian or Thomist natural law theory. The second is a Kantian so-called deontological theory. And the third is an, an intensification of that divine command tradition in the form of a love ethic of pure agape. My thesis for the moment will be that all of these have something to say for themselves in the light of or in reaction to our cumulative evidences for explicating an evolutionary ethics, though with certain contrastive advantage and disadvantage in relation to bridging that controversial gap between the pre-human and the human. While I am ultimately going to argue in this lecture series after a later, more detailed lecture on teleology in both Thomas Aquinas and Kant, that the Thomistic natural law theory is the option ultimately to be preferred, I am, for strategic reasons, going to keep all three of these alternatives in play for the moment. The first two because they represent an unusually interesting contrastive choice with different advantages and disadvantages in the light of the evolutionary evidences. And the last because it represents a major challenge, possibly a fatal blow to evolutionary thinking which it is particularly important that we do not shirk. Since I am keen to use exemplars here who have themselves struggled with the project of evolutionary ethics and the mathematical accounts of cooperation, and there aren't all that many such people, I quite shamelessly introduce at this point three friends and colleagues who have been part of Novak's and my wider circle of ethical investigation of cooperation and altruism. Let us see what we can learn from them and then draw some provisional conclusions. So first, natural law and virtue ethics. I here we're going to take Jean Porter of Notre Dame first as our promising exemplar of a natural law theorist who can fruitfully accommodate the evidences of Novak's math mathematical account of cooperation, but at the same time embed it in a meta-ethic which enriches the possibility of accounting for the phenomena that the mathematical approach does not adequately explain and which we have surveyed above. Let me make three main points about Porter's work in this area, which are, I hope, particularly suggestive. First, she is not afraid, despite her primary commitment to the regeneration of a scholastic natural law theory, to do creative business with very differently motivated modern psychological investigations of ethical intuitions in hunter-gatherers and higher primates, as pursued by the controversial ex-Harvard evolutionary psychologist Mark Hauser. As you may know, 
he has now been abjectly disgraced for manipulating the results of his experiments with monkeys, which rather incongruously were all done immediately underneath my office at the Divinity School. But Hauser's moral minds nonetheless remains, I think, a highly suggestive and important account of how certain apparently hardwired ethical intuitions seem to be present in many, if not all, so-called primitive or hunter-gatherer societies. Having tested sub subjects worldwide for their responses to something equivalent to the standard so-called trolley dilemmas, I expect you're familiar with these ethical dilemmas, um, ethical questions about which way to direct the runaway trolley down a hill that you're driving and thereby kill or save different sorts of people, very fat people, older people, smaller people, etc., etc. You've got to make the choices. What are your ethical intuitions? And Hauser, believe it or not, went all around Africa and India and set up variations on the trolley problem with um, elephants and uh, you know other such variants. Quite funny, really. And then he got people to sit down and respond to these dilemmas. On the basis of all this, Hauser concludes that we may hypothesize a universal ethical capacity rather equivalent to our innate, and he thinks parallel to Chomsky's vision, of human linguistic capacity, and indeed closely conjoined to it. Now, this is not a suggestion that we have shared ethical norms. It's a suggestion that we universally have a certain set of hardwired intuitional tendencies, which may then be filled in in local contexts with particular kinds of norms. Now, responding to Hauser's hypotheses along these lines, and also to Novak's mathematical account of the pervasiveness of evolutionary cooperation and altruism, Porter, in her contribution to the book that Novak and I have written together, which is coming out next year, rises to the methodological challenge and warmly supports these findings, only insisting herself that one should be prompted thereby to a deeper meta-ethical account than is proffered by Hauser to explain and contain them than the evolutionary theories themselves offer. So secondly then, it lies at the heart of Porter's own project for the regeneration of scholastic natural law theory that she must resist and debunk, this is very important, the standard modern charge against the so-called naturalistic fallacy as posed classically by Hume or by G.E. Moore. That is the charge that natural law accounts of ethics fallaciously attempt to slide from the merely descriptive, what is naturally found empirically, to the normative, what is good or right. And you could see that that might be uh, a charge brought against these trolley experiments. We've simply assessed a whole lot of evidence about what people say about their intuitions. In Riposte, she argues at length in her book, Nature as Reason, that it is a peculiarly modern problem thus to divorce factual and normative claims in so disjunctive a fashion as Hume and Moore proposed. As she puts it, many evaluative terms do have an inextricable descriptive content. And she gives an example. It would, for instance, she says, be nonsensical to say that someone who spends his life in a state of perpetual quivering anxiety, that is a neurophysiological description, is a brave man, an evaluation. There is an integral and natural connection here, she claims, between description and evaluation in such an assessment, which needs further exploration to resist overquick rejections of natural law alternatives in ethics. This recovery of an intrinsic collection, connection of nature and norm is Porter's way of levering back a revised Aristotelian notion of natural teleology. Evolutionary phenomena, for instance, on her view, may rightly be argued to be for something. Not because a design argument of a modern sort is aiming surreptitiously to smuggle back God into the equation as some kind of extrinsic teleological cause or intervener. This is always the great fear and suspicion of the secular biologist, of course. 
but simply because for Porter it is seemingly unavoidable to ask of such evolutionary phenomena in themselves, what is this for? This beak, this eye, this phenomenon of cooperation, this particular species. To put this issue more pointedly and in explicitly Aristotelian terms, I'm quoting Porter here, the language of purpose functions here in such a way to render the different components of a living creature intelligible in terms of their contributions to the life process of the creature as a whole, and thereby to give a normative account of its proper flourishing. Instead of merely asking what the outcomes of evolutionary cooperation are on this perspective, we should be asking about the flourishing they may engender. It is that question that the natural law theorists should be primarily interested in, and you can see how it immediately enriches the mere mathematical analysis of forms of cooperation and altruism. Now, this is, of course, highly contentious methodological territory for secular biology, and I'm going to come back to it next week. But we immediately glimpse its attractiveness for a possible accommodation of the contemporary evidences of cooperation and altruism into a larger framework of a natural law meta-ethic. It appears, potentially at least, to be able to explain how cooperation, non-intentional forms thereof, yet suited to levels of evolutionary life in which the phenomenon nonetheless enhances the flourishing of a species or group, could phase up into degrees of natural additor of richer and more complex forms of intentionality and purpose, say the do dolphin, the chimp, and finally into an account of specifically human flourishing in which more developed goals and purposes could be seen as equally naturally given. Of course, and thirdly, for Porter, this whole package is then wrapped more richly still within a Thomist theological vision of the human person as distinctive, yet within a continuity of natural creaturely life. As Thomas unfolds particularly in the Prima Secundae questions 91 and following, the distinctive human role, assigned no less providentially than the role given to each creature, is to participate in the special divine purposes for the human, including manifesting particular rational and self-transcending capacities through the activity of divine grace, including heights of altruistic love shared with the saviour God, Christ. Yet, in no way thereby, wrenching it away from its animal and bodily life and the proper operations as she puts it, which stem from those natural inclinations when rightly ordered to flourishing and virtue. One can readily see then, I hope, how such a neo-Aristotelian vision might readily accommodate, but also greatly theologically enrich, mathematically ordered accounts of the evolutionary patternings of cooperation and altruism. When enhanced further by a careful account such as recently supplied by Eleanor Stump, of the strongly affective way in which Thomas colours his understanding of moral choices. This becomes most vividly clear through considering the ethical implications of Thomas's doctrine of the spirit in the third part of the summer, often overlooked by neo-Aristotelian ethicists. There is arguably a yet more happy alliance with recent evolutionary investigations of the affective, empathetic nature of altruistic choices. Evolutionary altruism is on this perspective therefore brought to its proper perfection, not displaced, but fulfilled, just as grace perfects nature. So how secondly and in contrast does a Kantian approach to ethics and metaethics fare when measured against our evidences of evolutionary cooperation and altruism? John Hare of Yale, as a renowned modern exponent of Kantian so-called deontological ethics, has a very different rendition of how to read Novak's and others' evolutionary accounts of ethics, and the comparison with Porter's Thomistic vision is peculiarly instructive. Again, let me mention only three brief points to illumine our meta-ethical choices here. First, as a Kantian, Hare is especially concerned 
in contrast to the neo-Aristotelian natural law approach of Porter, to stress what we might call the supervenience of human moral autonomy over natural inclinations, which he reads, as a Calvinist as well as a Kantian, as disturbingly disordered in the condition we inherit them at birth. This is the corrupt, fallen nature of the human. Rather than to underscore the natural emergence of providentially graded forms of cooperation and altruism, one from the other. For Hare, it is always the gaps that are primarily problematic but important in ethics. First, the gap between what is natural to animals and what is demanded of us as humans, and then the more worrying gap about what is demanded of us as humans by the categorical imperative and the little we seem to be able to achieve in it in the face of our moral weakness. It is, of course, only God, again, who can ensure the closing of that gap, and Hare has spent much of his scholarly career bolstering Kant's own arguments on that score with a stronger account of grace than Kant himself appears to supply. So Hare, therefore, showed himself highly doubtful in his first interactions with the project of evolutionary ethics and of game theory to succumb to any merely naturalistic account of the cooperative, let alone the altruistic, capacity. In his first writing on this topic, his main concern was to debunk the possibility of building any ethical system out of a naturally corrupted nature, cooperative or not. As he put it, I quote, as a Kantian moral philosopher, I am not persuaded that game theory and its classical formulations can provide any satisfactory account of moral motivation. That is, an account of why we should be bound by the moral law. Note how he's reinstantiating the disjunction between empiricism and morality there, just as Porter attempted to deflate that distinction. However, secondly, he has more recently softened up a bit, partly because we gave him a lot of nice lunches at the Programme for Evolutionary Dynamics, I think, at Harvard. Um, and he has uh, begun to think a little bit more positively, realizing perhaps, though he never says it so far explicitly, that the great advantage of an evolutionary component conjoined to a Kantian ethics is that it might supply a clue as to how the moral law is, according to Kant, so firmly lodged in our human consciousness and so strikingly universal in its felt demands. Here, surely, the evidences of cooperation provide at least some suggestive material for further creative reflection. Certainly, Hare is at least partly admiring rather surprisingly, I think, of those evolutionary investigators of hunter-gatherer religious impulses, such as Dominic Johnson and Jesse Baring, who link them to divine rewards and punishments, a hypothesis that Hare finds exceptionally congenial, given his support of Kant's theory of the necessary eschatological accord between how we have acted in this life and how we must presume we are to be rewarded finally. But thirdly and finally, while chiding evolutionary primate investigators such as Duval for many theoretic mistakes in their attempts at characterizing proto-ethical impulses in the apes and declaring that we could never confidently hypothesize an inside to an ape at all. That's wonderful. Well, no, apes don't have insides. Hare nonetheless finds the investigation of the relation of affect, desires, and reason that these projects enshrine at least suggestive as background for the rich account that Kant himself gives, richer than normally acknowledged, between feelings, desire, and rational ethical ends. It is, as Hare shows in his excellent recent Faith and Philosophy article of 2011, only passions which Kant now rejects as negative, in contrast to Descartes, but not the feeling realm as such, on which he has a highly nuanced appreciation of its important role in ethical intentionality. Here again, then, is a point of potential convergence of interests with evolutionary accounts of the relation of feeling and rationality, albeit for Hare, distinctively different in the case of the human, who possesses the particular characteristics of moral autonomy and also faces the radical demands of the moral law. It is, however, because Hare follows Kant in insisting that the very demands of morality 
make an as-if presumption about the existence of God a necessity. But he continues to be intrigued by evolutionary investigations of the origins of human religion, even despite the tendency of such arguments to presume that hunter-gatherers' gods were merely constructed projections which contemporary secular societies can well now do without. For Hare, though, there is an argument of sufficient interest here, profoundly connected to the ancient archetypal fear of divine punishment that exercises him greatly, that makes him willing to run the gauntlet and do business even with reductionist tending evolutionary psychologists. It follows, therefore, that there might be more creative business that a Kantian meta-ethic could do with evolutionary evidences of cooperation as a sort of preparatio, you might say, for the demand, universalism, and altruistic logic of the categorical imperative. But the stern disjunction in Kant between the causal mechanisms of the natural world, as treated in the first critique, and the universal ethical demands made on the radically autonomous subject in the second critique make it supremely difficult to chart any natural continuity between the animal and human worlds in Kant's particular account of the relation of fact and value. We come finally then, and in a last and even stronger contrast, to the more ardent divine command theoretician Timothy Jackson of Emory, who is vehement that his model of ethics, explicitly founded in the demanding love command of Jesus himself, will not fit into any evolutionary account of ethics, and especially not into a mathematically calculated one, except perhaps as what the evolutionary theorists sometimes call a spandrel, that is, a random and meaningless branch of development without hope of continuation. Jackson was, to say the least, an amusing and challenging presence for a semester in our research program with Novak at Harvard, and his strong revulsion towards the mathematicalization of cooperative encounters and the utilitarian leaning talk of payoffs and strategies kept us all on our toes and actually purged out into critical view for the first time that Novak was unthinkingly using this kind of utilization of language associated more naturally with um, utilitarian meta-ethics. But maybe this is the point for Jackson. It's a matter of prophetic witness for him that he resists any such attempts at tidying the arena of love. For him, following in the steps of Kierkegaard on the one hand and the saintly Bishop of Lund and this Newgrin on the other, Christian agapic love can only be that which moves beyond any calculation of gain to a sort of teleological suspension of the ethical, to use Kierkegaard's phrase, or to a love beyond any self-fulfillment, eros, on Newgren's distinctly idiosyncratic rendition of the Platonic tradition on that theme. For Jackson, the purity of intention in love ethics should even rule out hopes and prospects of any eschatological reward. Loving one's enemies is the demand, and every eude eudaimonistic goal, even a heavenly one, must be rigorously set aside if one is to be a true follower. Now, we seem here to have met a final denouement in our quest to align evolutionary ethics and sophisticated meta-ethics of various sorts. Jesus' love ethic, viewed in terms of genetic evolution, odd as it may seem initially to conduct such a thought experiment, is indeed a direct undercutting of all interest in genetic heritage. Jesus' ethic of unconditional forgiveness and excessive fidelity to agape in face of torture and death is meaningless in that particular evolutionary sense. He died without offspring and was initially even reviled and despised in terms of the calculus of what we would now call cultural evolutionary influence. Viewed in terms of the mechanics of cooperation or altruism then, this Jesus seems to slip through the gap and hence Jackson's exasperated critique of Novakian cooperative analysis. Yet nonetheless, let me to suggest to you a more challenging possibility remains, and it is one that we shall leave here to pick up again next week. That is, what if Jesus' ethic of seemingly self-destructive sacrificial excess, instead of being seen as irreducibly hostile to preparatory forms of evolutionary cooperation and altruism, 
might itself be a fulfillment and completion of them, and in the light of the resurrection, a means of a completely new form of cultural evolution, a form sustained in the excessive, uncalculating mode of a new type of cooperative community. Is it possible, then, that this ecstatic ethics of excess could, after all, nonetheless be theorized evolutionarily in a novel, cultural, yet eschatological mode, not as a meaningless spandrel, as, Je as Jackson sees it, but as a horizon of evolutionary hope capable of producing saints beyond the constraints of normal, more limited evolutionary concerns. I leave you today with that thought, and let me now draw some very brief conclusions to tonight's reflections. I have been probing today what meta-ethical alternatives to a narrow genetic consequentialism might most adequately account, and I stress this, it's not just which ones you happen to like, which tends to be consistent with the uh, evidences, but what most adequately accounts for the cooperative and altruistic lessons of evolution. Not just to complement the intricate mathematical scaffolding provided by the evolutionary theorists, but also to illuminate the remarkable continuum between pre-human and human forms of cooperation and the even more remarkable tension between good human altruistic actions and pure human altruistic intentions. Along the way, we have noted intriguing excesses of various forms, as I've called them, suggestions of an ecstasis, one might say, of a form of cooperative endeavor which laps at the edges of the mathematical calculus in both animal and human worlds and calls them to a higher but as yet not completely theorizable level of intensity and perhaps universalization. Is this, then, an intimation of a special sort of rational sacrifice, as I promised at the outset of this series, a sacrifice actually beyond mathematical calculation, yet somehow forming its completion? Yet we cannot begin to answer this essentially theological and Christological question until we have also turned the spotlight on another place where sacrifice features most intensively in the evolutionary spectrum. For where is evolutionary cost more centrally and acutely felt for sexually reproducing creatures than in the production, or sometimes strategic or accidental non-production, of genetic offspring? How does this arena now look in the light of the threat to the regnant inclusive fitness theory? To this issue, that of the complex relations of sexual selection, gender and cooperation, we turn our attention next time. Thank you. I think um, there's probably an appropriate 10 minutes or so questions mm -hmm. and discussion, and thank you for the uh, good field view. Thank you very much for another very intriguing lecture. Uh, what I want to ask, and you may have planned to come on to this later, uh, but uh, the whole question of consciousness in this, um, because if the assumption is made that uh, animals other than ourselves do not have consciousness as we perceive it, then the whole moral question seems to me to be uh, made in a sense different in our case than mm -hmm. in the rest of the animal kingdom. At the same time, I completely take the point you make about the precursors, mm -hmm. which could be carried forward, uh, but in some way monitored and decisions made by an active will of choice uh, in our own case. Okay. And uh, your views on this would be much appreciated, but if you are coming on to this later and rather leave it over, then I understand. Not at all. I'm, I'm very glad you asked that because I have to admit I'm slightly stepping around it since it is an enormously technical question of philosophy of mind. And this, of course, is the central, the sort of $64,000 question when discussing the relationship between 
what I call blip and block between cooperation and altruism. How are you going to give an account of how one um, comes after the other? Does one build on the other? Does it radically supervene over it? What is your theory of mind? Now, I lean towards, I used not to, I used to be much more of a Kantian, but partly because of the evidences of these extraordinary higher mammals, which I've now taken very seriously, I lean towards an emergent theory of mind, and um, therefore of a, what's sometimes called a dimmer switch approach to the um, intensification emergence of consciousness. And what I am going to come on to, which is very um, unusual, I think, um, to complement that move at the end of these lectures, is I'm going to retrieve a tradition out of the patristic heritage called the spiritual senses tradition, which argues that humans themselves exist on a continuum of a dimmer switch whereby our consciousnesses actually can be intensified by various practices of prayer and transformation such that we see the world more truly than if we hadn't undergone that transformation. So this is my vision, which I'm not spending these lectures defending. I am, as it were, hinting at it, as I did today, rather than actually arguing it. Um, but I hope that helps. In other words, I see... Dolphins have absolutely remarkable anticipators of certain forms of human um, intentionality, what philosophers of the mind often call aboutness, uh, capacity to have beliefs, to um, respond to events, to make decisions, and so on and so forth. And I think we just can't ignore this anymore. Does that help a bit? Well, it does, yes. <laughs> it, it helps to uh, give this ongoing perspective or mm. whatever. And... Uh, I look forward to the rest of the lectures when this will be clarified. Thank you. Thank you. I wondered if you could use those three different types of ethics to, um, to illustrate the differences between them by using each one in turn to explain Wes's behaviour. I think I can see how the well. latter two would, but not the first. Mm. Um, let's do this together, shall we? Can you, can you help me? Um, <coughs> I think on a Porterian, um, near Aristotelian view of the sort which she wants to propose, which of course is very much an adjusted near Aristotelianism because it's adjusted in the light of contemporary biology, um, she would say, probably, that the uh, genetic inheritances that we have in our human makeup um, that come out of animal behaviours of affective empathetic responses, which are automatic, as it were, um, were here particularly pointedly in action, but they were complemented and intensified by a very fast rational choice based on some actual knowledge of railways. Um, but probably the motivational aspect was profoundly animal, she would say, I think. Is that how you would read her on that one? Um, no, I felt that I didn't, and I couldn't really see the explanation of the behaviour at but all. On the near Aristotelian one. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Now the Kantian one, probably more straightforward. It's a response to the a form of one of the forms of the categorical imperative, um, and it's a very quick decision to do that. Um, I tend to think of Kant as sort of taking time to think about this through, but obviously there wasn't, wasn't time to muse about it, um, that one should behave to someone else as one would want to be behaved to. Um, so I think that's probably... But there, a rational choice is supervening over, it seems to me, bodily um, factors. Although, as I noted, there is much more in Kant about the importance of even physiological desires and feelings for rational choice than many people notice. And I've really learned a lot from John Hare there. So I don't think it's just a straightforward mind over body. Um, and the Kierkegaardian one, I think, is a much more 
straightforward in a way, although it seems much more difficult. That here is an example of radical, a capacity, a, a moment of choice for radical Jesus oriented altruistic endeavor. It's a demand that should be done at the cost of one's own life. Now, okay. do, do, do fire back. How, how are you reading it? Probably incorrectly. <laughs> no, tell uh, me. Let's hear. Let's hear. Uh, in the, in the final case, mm. I don't know, because in effect he spontaneously loved that person. Mm. In the middle case, because he would have been severely punished if he didn't. Mm. But in the first case, I, I don't quite see mm -hmm. what the explanation is. There's, there's a large um, realm of evolutionary psychology representing people like Joshua Haidt and um, is it Joshua Haidt? Jonathan Haidt and Joshua Green. Um, and I think their work is at the moment very um, speculative, which tries to sort of figure out in any decision like this, where you've got a choice between an altruistic decision and a not so altruistic one, a drawing back, what's going on neurophysiologically. <laughs> and I think most um, neurophysiologists are quite suspicious of radical disjunctions being made explanatorily between older emotional parts of the brain and more recently developed human rational capacities because they're so um, electrically interconnected. But there does seem to be some necessity to a given account of, as it were, that neurological underpinning somewhere in the neo-Aristotelian approach, I would say. Thank you for asking a wonderful question. <laughs> Time for one mm. more. Yes. Why do three different ethical systems have to be, why do you have to choose? Why do they have to be mutually exclusive choices? I mean, it, this just doesn't seem to fit with evolution at all, since mm -hmm. evolution clearly allows for immense diversity and, in fact, can't survive without diversity. Mm -hmm. and well, one of the arguments I, that I would make is if evolution is optimizing anything, then perhaps evolution is simply optimizing evolution and, and mm -hmm. creating this diversity. So why, why not have all three um, ethical systems simultaneously? Sometimes one predominates, sometimes the other is the, is the way we, we, we should make choices, sometimes sometimes a third, perhaps even other things. It just doesn't seem to be um, at all consistent with any kind of human thought that one should exclude. Uh, well, thank you very much for th that question, which helps me clear up a possible misunderstanding. First of all, um, of course there will always be a variety of evolutionary theories. I mean, empirically speaking, there just are, and I'm not trying to clean up that act. By using these three in a Weberian sense, ideal types of meta-ethical, I wanted to sharpen the mind about the problems of bringing the particular mathematical account of cooperation and altruism, which seems in one way so suggestive as a wedge against a purely selfish rendition of evolution, and yet so easily overtaken again by a reductive genetic interpretation and ask, well, let's look at a range of alternatives which seem to have resources to deal with these evidences much more richly. But if at the end of looking at those, you empirically want to say, well, there are always going to be a lot of such theories, I wouldn't disagree with you at all. But the more interesting question for me is, do you want to, as it were, take parts of these and put them together? Because that's also another completely possible option. Um, in fact, many ethical theorists now do have dimensions of the ontological and um, uh, natural law um, theory particularly put together. Increasingly, people are discovering that Kant himself has a sort of natural law dimension to his ethics, slightly secondarily and hidden. So there's no reason why we can't go on from here and put these creatively together if it can be done coherently. I wanted to do this just to sharpen the mind and ask how we're going to rescue these fascinating evolutionary evidences from a knee-jerk reductionism.
which is where they're going unless they are going to be rescued in their view. That's just how they are being taken in the discussion at large. So thanks for that, both as clarifying that I'm not trying to disqualify lots of options, and secondly for clarifying that you personally may want to decide that it's possible to mix at least two of these together in some coherent fashion. Thank you. Well, uh, Sarah's fulsome answers take us to the end of our time for this evening, so thank you very much indeed. Um, the lectures continue on Thursday, sorry, we'll get the, the timing <laughs> in a minute, um, with uh, ethics, cooperation, and the gender wars, prospects for a new asceticism, uh, 6 p.m. in the auditorium here. Let's say thank you to Sarah for her. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.